Lift up your Bibles with me now. Lift up your Bibles with me now and say, Father God in heaven, heaven. let your word be in my mind. Let your word be in my heart. And let your word be on my lips. And let your grace show in my life. Amen and amen. Okay. So we're going to read from Samuel today. So what's God saying to us today then? Hmm. Okay. It says here in verse in chapter 6 verse 1 Again David gathered all the choice men of Israel 30,000 and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from the, there the ark of God whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. So God is so holy that the people of God could not actually speak his name. And so therefore, he was called Yahweh. And he is called here, as far as they're concerned, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. Now the cherubim, as you probably remember, on the Ark of the Covenant, on the main part of the Ark of the Covenant, it's like a big box with holes for handles either side. And it's got two cherubim, gold cherubim on the box. And this was the mercy seat of of God. So this is what would be taken into the Holy of Holies within the temple compound, within, at that time, the tabernacle, which was the tabernacle of God that they moved around um, in all uh, of their journeys. They took the ark with them that would go ahead of them. And when they would stop, they would erect the tabernacle. And then there would be this inner tent in the tabernacle Uh, and then there would be this holy of holies within the main tent so in that holy of holies which only the high priest could enter once a year they actually put the ark of the covenant and this was the mercy seat of God so there would be a pillar of fire or a cloud over this ark and that's they recognized that this was where the presence of God would come and speak to his people so this is quite an important thing. So of course the Philistines had taken the ark and they'd managed to capture it. Um, but in actual reality, um, they, David obviously knew that this was, you know, this was important to, to the people of God and they wanted the ark to be with them. And so they set out to get the ark back and they brought it on a new cart. Um, and obviously we know that something pretty awful happened after that. But this is what was going on, okay? So this is kind of setting the scene for us. Um, And so they set the ark of God on a new car and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahayu, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahayu went before the ark. And then David... And all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments. So we're talking about worshipping God. This is what they were doing. Um, And they were using all kinds of instruments. So when we have a situation in church where people um, get a bit upset because people play instruments, sometimes people don't like drums, they don't like guitars, they don't like uh, trumpets, they don't like all sorts of things. You know, people don't like anything sometimes. You, You can't please anybody. But... You know, there is nothing wrong with playing instruments and we welcome the idea of people playing instruments. Um, I think it's relevant to the worship of what instruments are being played. So we have to be sensitive in our worship and work out what we're doing. But it's good that we actually have people that want to play instruments and it's good to encourage people to play instruments. But of course there needs to be a bit of a balance. And obviously if you've got a a, a lot of people, there was 30,000 men, 30,000 warriors here and obviously they were making a lot of noise. So it's a little bit um, different in a church situation. If you've got a large church, then people often have massive, great big bands and lots of noise. And, you know, it, 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 it's a great experience. If you've ever been in that kind of worship, uh, like at um, 
spring harvest or any major conferences and you have this great time of worship with with good uh, worship leaders and uh, you know I've had some very good worship leaders in the past that I've actually been singing w- within the ministry that's been going on there and it's an um, amazing experience it's wonderful to be with God's people singing praising God with all the instruments and you know a lot of people and it's great when we're in a small service like this we can't afford to have loads of instruments playing because we wouldn't even hear our voices so and we need to know what we're singing so this is important that we kind of get a balance to it it's quite important nothing wrong with it I fully um, endorse it I think it's great and you, you have to work out what you're doing it depends on the size of your fellowship at the time what's going on and who's there that actually can play instruments and play them well this is important. We do things with excellence for God. Um, and there's nothing wrong with singing a cappella. There's nothing wrong when we're singing as a, as a group, in small groups, in house groups, where we're singing without instruments. It doesn't matter. The important thing is we're worshipping God at the end of the day. That's the most important thing. And we're doing it with enthusiasm. <laughs> you know, that we're opening our mouths and actually singing and giving God the glory. This is important. So David, obviously, and all the house of Israel played these instruments and uh, you know before the Lord as they were bringing these uh, the Ark of the Covenant in anyway there was something nasty that happened but we're going to go to verse 12 and um, 12b so David went and brought up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness and so it was when those bearing the Ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep So David obviously appreciated the power of God and certainly the power of God and the presence of the Ark of the Covenant where God would, this would be God's mercy seat and this was a very holy um, symbol of of God's power and might and and was something that had presence with it that that God actually did move and, and work with the people through this Ark of the Covenant this is where the, the tablets of stone were inside and the scrolls were inside and Moses' Moses rod that budded um, that he had. These were inside the Ark of the Covenant. These were inside the box aspect or the seat, under the seat, under the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And, you know, this is something really important um, to the people of God. These were holy relics that God had actually supplied and God had done some amazing things with. And so this is why it was so important to David that he realized that the presence of God was with this ark. And therefore, this is why he was making so much of a, an impression and, and such an important aspect of it that he even sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep as the ark moved along. And then David danced, it says, he danced before the Lord with all his might and David was wearing a linen ephod. So obviously David wasn't wearing a great deal. And uh, so he was a king, and this was not seemly. You know, the king has got no clothes. This was not seemly. People could see him, and what some people would possibly do is when they see the man rather than the position or the status um, or, you know, the office, when people see the man quite often that they despise what they see. When they see someone's flaws as a leader, they despise what they see. They don't see the person necessarily then as a man of God. They don't see someone as being anointed by God. David had been anointed by God. And so this was really um, very difficult for some people to deal with. It wasn't because David did wrong. On the contrary, David was worshipping God and being himself and just he was so exuberant and and really keen to worship God and he was dancing his head off. You know, he was really dancing like no one was watching. Unfortunately, someone was watching. And uh, this someone was obviously the wife that he'd got, the daughter of Saul, um, the king previous to him. When he died, obviously, he took his daughter as his wife. And so when Michal is there, She's actually watching him. It says in verse 15, So so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. So they're making a hell of a din. 
they're really making a right racket and they're really shouting and worshipping and you know if someone's not really in that worship and, and you're singing your heart out or you're shouting praises to God and you're making a lot of noise sometimes people get a bit annoyed some people don't see the point of it they don't actually understand your heart they don't see that you're just trying to praise God so if you happen to be making a bit of noise or you're really exuberant in your worship you know we mustn't despise a person for doing that that's good there's nothing wrong with that so we mustn't get to a point where we you know we, f we despise someone because they're showing their enthusiasm for God but people who aren't really in God are going to find that a bit difficult people who are not really following God are going to find it very very difficult to accept other people in their enthusiasm for God if you don't have a lot of enthusiasm for God then maybe you'd find that a bit uncomfortable uh, when you were there watching the king himself prancing about like a you know a young thing just dancing around with all his might with all his manhood and all his glory and you know he was just praising God at the end of the day that was the whole point um, and it says verse 16 now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David Michal Saul's daughter looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord and she despised him in her heart so it makes you wonder what was in her heart it makes you wonder what was in the heart of Michal okay what was going on in Michal's heart says in verse 17 so they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it so he'd already got the tabernacle he'd already set it all up it was there waiting ready for the ark of the covenant to make it complete to be the house of God this was all in, in, in order as far as David was concerned then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord and when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts then he distributed among all the people among the whole multitude of Israel both the women and the men to everyone a loaf of bread a piece of meat and a cake of raisins so all the people departed everyone to his house so it was a real celebration and it was about uniting the people together around the Ark of the Covenant and to bring people back to worship God and to recognize the fact that God God's presence was back with his people where it should be with the ark safely with them amen so let's just move on then to uh, Amos to what Amos is saying Okay, so we're moving on in time, obviously, and this is, you know, m much later, and this is one of the minor prophets, Amos, the book of Amos, and Amos was someone who was very clever, um, and he was just a fig farmer and a, and a shepherd, a breeder of sheep, but basically his main task was he was a fig farmer from Tekoa, uh, Tekoa in, in this land, and, and he, so he was a very humble uh, in, as far as other people are concerned, a very unimportant kind of person. Um, he had very humble beginnings and he certainly didn't feel that he was any kind of prophet. He hadn't been trained to be a prophet, he hadn't been, um, he wasn't a priest, he wasn't involved in, in, the, you know, in the ministry in any sort of way and, and yet um, God called him and what he did was something very clever uh, in that Amos um, began to, to prophesy to the people all around. He always brought um, the, the thing back to uh, the people of God. But he, he would say things like the people of, you know, of Syria and other, other countries, other places, were doing wrong and God wasn't going to be pleased with them and God was going to judge them for these things. <coughs> but he eventually, so he started off and of course got people's agreement that uh, he was on the right, on the right track, you know, because all these horrible people that they didn't like around them, obviously, <coughs> they were happy to hear that God was going to judge them. <coughs> but then it comes back to themselves, and you know, it's like 
when you go to church and, and you, you, you ask people, you know, what did you get from the sermon this week? And people say, well, you know, I'm, I, there was a really good message for such and such. It's a shame they weren't here. Um, it's suddenly, you know, people are kind of take, take that kind of a personal thing that's always about someone else. It's never about me. It's always about what's out there. <coughs> and so Amos was one of these uh, prophets who <coughs> cleverly brought this back to the people of God. And so this is now something where God is speaking through Amos and didn't particularly want to go to this city, the local city, um, because he really just wanted to, to carry on what his normal work was. But God called him and sent him away. And so in verse 7, uh, it says, Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. Now, I don't know if everyone understands what a plumb line is. I can see some frowns wondering what a plumb line is. <coughs> what a plumb line is, is an actual string uh, and a weight. That's basically what it is. And if you want to get a wall going up straight, you need a plumb line to come out from the side of the wall so you have a per <coughs> perpendicular line which is covered by gravity to make that line perfectly correct and upright <coughs> when you're building a wall, when you're building any buildings. Plumb line is a builder's tool. <coughs> it's almost as important as the foundations. If you don't get the foundations right, you're not going to be able to build straight. And if you do, it's going to subside. But the plumb line is to make sure that it's straight. <coughs> And what he's saying is um, that Amos is, is saying, um, Behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumber. In other words, the Lord is standing on something very straight. He's standing on something that is solid and there's no distortion in it. So this is where God is talking to you and I and saying, <coughs> I'm coming from, from the point of my standards and my holiness which is absolutely perfect and correct there is no distortions there's no deviations this is my truth this is the the word that i'm giving you thus says the word thus says the lord yeah and so the lord said to me amos what do you see and i said a plumb line then the lord said behold i'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people israel in other words, he's saying, I'm going to give you a very strong standard of what is right and straight and what is wrong. <coughs> this is what he's saying. Um, I will not pass by them anymore. What does that mean? Well, it means he's not going to overlook their sins anymore. He's going to say, this is where, you know, you may have been sinning your head off, but I'm not going to overlook it anymore. In other words, my patience has run out. So I'm saying to you, this is the correct path. This is the straight and narrow <coughs> and this plumb line is my plumb line. So I'm talking to you. It's my plumb line. I'm giving you something which is very important. And it says in verse 9, The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with a sword against the house of Jeroboam. <coughs> so here we are, some years later after David, and the people of God are going astray completely. <coughs> and what's happened is that you know, they have become um, complacent towards God. The, the people in charge have, have grown fat on their couches, according to Amos previously, and, and they are oppressing the people. So the leaders of the people are actually oppressing the people and they're not treating them right. And they're really corrupt. Amos talks about a real corruption in, in the land that people are corrupting their scales when they when they sell things they they corrupt and they <coughs> they make the they they alter the scales so that people don't get what they're supposed to get for their money and so on and so forth and so he says the high places of Isaac shall be desolate <coughs> so the people of God in Canaan in the high places in the in the hill country they, this is going to be desolate they're going to be totally devastated in the midst of my people Israel, I'll not pass by them anymore. The sanctuaries of Israel. So these sanctuaries, these places, places like Shechem and you know Jerusalem and all these other places that you know Shiloh and all these places where God had actually done some amazing things. These um, 
were going to be laid waste. So any, any structures, anything that, that the people of God had done, all the different things that they'd done, putting up, you know, statues and all sorts of things, they were going to be laid waste, these, these areas. And it says, I will rise with a sword against the house of Jeroboam. So something nasty was going to come against them because they had been measured and found wanting. And so this is a word which is quite harsh for us today, that God is looking at your life and God has a plumb line. And if you are not right with God, then obviously that plumb line is going to measure you in relation to your understanding of God's word and ignorance is no mercy in the law, as we know. And he's going to measure you by your understanding of his word and your application of his word in your life. And whether you're going to go by God's standards or follow the world's standards, which is something else completely different. And so God is saying something very strong to us today. We have to take notice of what he says. He says in verse 10, Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. <coughs> so this is, this is the priest. <laughs> so the corruption goes deep. This is the priest. And he's the priest of Bethel. That place where Jacob had, you know, angels ascending and descending. This was the place of Bethel where Jacob laid his head on the stone and he saw heaven open. This was a, a, a very holy site. And this is the priest of that site. They're supposed to be a priest of God. And when Amos says, look, you know, you've been found wanting, instead of getting on his knees uh, and, ask, and, be, and being repentant and asking forgiveness of God for himself and for the people, he rushes off to the king another corrupt person, and he says, you know, the land can't hear Amos's words because they're so harsh, you know, uh, because people don't like to hear harsh words. They like to hear nice strokes, you know, oh, you're wonderful people, you're lovely people, yeah, there's nothing wrong with you at all, you never sin, you're so great, you're wonderful, you know, God loves you completely and he's not, he's not bothered about anything you do wrong. This is what people want to hear. And just allow us to do what we want to do and not be accountable. But that's not, the, that's not why prophets were there. The prophet Amos is there for a reason. He wasn't anyone special as far as God's house was concerned. But he became someone special because God suddenly sends him out of his normal work and then to actually preach to the people of God. And that's what happens. It says in verse 11, For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. So, of course, the priest is really, he's going to get hold of this, and he's telling Jeroboam, you know what he's saying about you? He's saying you're going to die by the sword. So, of course, the king's not going to be very happy. So he's going to curry favor with the king. And Israel should surely be led away captive. So if you're the king of a kingdom of people, and someone comes along to the city and starts spouting that, you know, your whole people are going to be taken away captive, you're not going to be very pleased, are you? Um, Verse 12 says, Then Amaziah said to Amos, So then Amaziah starts telling Amos what he thinks of him, and he says, Go, you seer. <coughs> a seer is someone who sees, sees into the future. Obviously prophecy. Flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread, and there prophesy. In other words, just get out of this place. We don't want you here. Go back to where you came from. You know, go back to uh, Judah. <coughs> go to... Go to the other side of the fence, if you like. Um, you know, Israel and Judah. Go to the other side and just, you know, go and prophesy there because we don't really want to hear what you're saying. Verse 13. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the royal residence. So Jeroboam had obviously set up shop here. This was his sanctuary, his royal residence. Um, and so obviously Amaziah felt that he was, you know, fully in control of the situation. He was the, he was the leader uh, I, I, as the lead minister in, in Bethel and uh, he was a priest and so everyone should take note of what he says because this, this chap was just a fig farmer and you know, who, what did he know anyway? And he needs to go back to where he came from. So this, is, this was the attitude. Instead of getting right, so you know, even through the mouths of babes that sometimes you know, God speaks to us, 
But this is actually someone who's, who's been sent. He's, he's not interested in being a prophet. He's not interested in the status of being a prophet. He's not interested in the power of being a prophet. He's just being obedient to God and telling people what God's told him. In other words, he's just literally telling them what the word of God has, has come to him. And this priest who's supposed to know better, as we find quite often in the, the scriptures, where the people of, who are supposed to be leaders are the ones that are just as corrupt as the people, if not more. Because they're complicit with, with what people are, are doing and, and, and not actually standing up for what God says. So this is all wrong. Verse 14, Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. So I wasn't a seer at all. But I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. And then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. And that's a message for us. Now, it may well be that you may be doing some very humble work and some humble job, and God suddenly calls you out of what you're doing to become a mouthpiece for him, to actually be a preacher and to prophesy and explain God's word to people because there's two aspects of prophecy. One is foretelling and the other is forthtelling. Okay? So, I preach and I forthtell the word of God every Sunday usually and other times if I get the opportunity. But there is also the foretelling of the word which is the prophetic way that we're talking about which can be for something in the near future and it also can have bearing on the middle future and possibly even the far future and and so that is foretelling rather than just foretelling the word and so there is an element of prophecy because we are speaking God's word I'm talking about what Amos is saying here and so that prophecy <coughs> only had bearing on the people of Israel at that time but did it also have a bearing on the people of other times through history including now it could well have. This is a prophecy that God has given to Amos to be told. And it never returns void. And it doesn't mean to say that it's time limited. It doesn't mean to say that it's got a date stamp like our food. You know, eat by such and such. You know, best by such and such. No, this is, this is God's words. It's eternal. It, it continues and it keeps on going. And so this is a word for us too today. And it's important to understand that God is saying to us today that we need to be aware that his patience runs out. So we mustn't just ignore what he's saying. We've got to take it seriously. We can't just ignore him and think that everything will be all right on the night. So this is particularly for people who are not following God, people who are anti-God. You know, God is not stupid. God is taking notice, God knows what's going on and therefore we have to be very careful that we don't start getting corrupt and mocking God because God will not be pleased. Anyway, let's just move to Ephesians and this is chapter 1 and this is from verse 3 onwards. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 <coughs> So Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So, you have to understand that your blessings come from God. Your blessings don't just come because you do something right and it works out for you. You become blessed by God. And even the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, it actually blessed if you go back and read the bit in between our reading today, it actually blessed the person where David took the ark before he was a bit afraid of the ark and worried about taking it into his, um, into his sanctuary because you know someone had already died by touching it. And so it was quite a dangerous thing. If you weren't right, you, know, you couldn't touch holy things. And so this is the same sort of situation here, that if you're right with God, then God is going to bless you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So, the spiritual always determines the physical. So, when we say someone is blessed, it means we are blessed spiritually, but it nevertheless will always affect the physical. So, although it's a spiritual blessing, it will overflow into the physical blessings. 
verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So this is telling us something very strong, that we were chosen, you were chosen before the foundation of the world. What does that feel like, to know that God knew you even before the foundation? He knew that you were going to be conceived and born even before the foundation of the world. This is how God has a complete understanding of you and everybody else in this world and understands us completely, not partially, but he knew exactly what was going to happen. Okay? And he knew that we should be, bl be holy and without blame before him in love. So not through rules and regulations, but in love. Did you notice that? This is about grace again, that even at the foundation of the world, he knew about you, and he knew that you were going to become holy and without blame before him in love, in the love of Christ, obviously. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by C Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So he's saying, you were predestined. This is something that some people find hard to get their head around. That there is a predestination that we have to understand. We think we've done it all. But, you know, don't, you know, don't get over yourself. You know, don't get above yourself. God has done this. God has called you. God has brought you to this place. And God predestined you for it. This was your destiny. Imagine that this was your destiny to be touched by God, to be called by God, and, and to have the Holy Spirit come and speak into your life, and to convict you of sin, and to draw you through his love to make yourself complete in him, to be reconciled back to him so that you would live a different kind of life than you were before. That God really has got something wonderful in store for you. That he's called you to something special. Now, it's not because of you. It's not because you're great in your own strength or in your own right or that you're perfect in your own way. You know, it's right for us to love ourselves because God loves us. But, you know, we also need to understand that God didn't choose us because we were so wonderful. God chose us through his grace. We were all destined for punishment and death. Every one of us for punishment and death because of the fall, because we are inherently sinful people. We sin, whether we accept it or not, we are sinners. And God loves us, even in that state, and had mercy and grace upon us, that he would call us and choose us out of his own grace and mercy, not because of our own merits, but because he just chose us. And so therefore we've got nothing to boast about ourselves about, this is where our humility comes from. This is where our grace starts to build. There is nothing in us that God finds worthy of us to be saved. We must understand that. Because until you get that, you won't be humble. You'll always think, well, there's a reason God chose me, because there must be something special about me. Well, there is something special, and it's God's choice that it was special. That's what's special, not you as a person. God is no respecter of persons, remember? He doesn't choose one person because they're more rich or they're, you know, they're this or that different th than, than other people and chooses them because that. He chose them out of his mercy and his grace. And so he predestined us to be adopted, to become joint heirs with Jesus Christ, to become princes and princesses in his kingdom, to become saints in his kingdom. So we were sinners and he chooses us before the foundation of the world, to destiny that is about being adopted to become part of his family as a brother or sister of Christ, to become princes or princesses in the kingdom of God. Amazing that he would do that. That he just chose some. That it would be us. And that's wonderful. And all we can do is thank him for that. All we can do is praise him for it. Verse 6, To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved, the Beloved being Jesus. So he made us accepted in the Beloved. In other words, Christ covered us by his blood. That made us accepted by the Beloved. That's how we got there, because he made us accepted. We were not accepted before that. Only in Christ could we be accepted. Verse 7, In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. 
So it's all about his grace. It's not about the fact that we have been fulfilling the law. Like Christ came and fulfilled the law and was perfect and was baptized, baptized so that the law would be fulfilled and then it was closed off as the old aspect of the law and then it became a new covenant of grace. But we were not perfect. We can only be redeem redeemed. We can only be in redemption through his blood. And so it's all about the riches of his grace that he's chosen to bless us through Christ. This is amazing. Verse 8, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. So it certainly weren't our good pleasure, it certainly weren't our will that was involved in this situation. It was all a work of God. And so sometimes we begin to think, well, it's because I, I accepted Christ into my life. Because we have a prayer and we ask people to, to you know, give their life to Jesus, to accept Jesus into that. But this word tells us that you know, all of that is just froth and bubble. As far as we're concerned, it's a work of God from start to finish. He is the author of our faith. He is the, he is the start of and the end of our faith. He's the beginning and the end of our faith. And so therefore we can trust God with our lives completely because he's already predestined us to be gloried in him, to be glorified through him, that we become something different because he's already done the work. The work is already there. He's already planned it out. And whatever God decides comes to pass. Whatever God tells us comes to pass. What he told Amos came to pass. Israel was obliterated. And as we know, right the way through the Old Testament, there is always a remnant that God keeps for himself. That's what this history of, of the Old Testament is, is teaching us. That if you follow God, you're going to be safe. These are the people on the narrow road that leads to life. And those people that are on the broad road that leads to destruction, these are the people that were obliterated. So there's always a, a remnant running through the Old Testament to testify to us, to show us that God only dealt with the people that were not obedient and it was their choice not to be obedient. He only dealt with them harshly because they were being disobedient and the people that were actually obedient to him and followed him and really made him their God and really followed him, they were blessed. They were kept for himself. Verse 9 says, Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. So he created this plan of redemption. He purposed all this in himself. It wasn't our idea. Don't get above yourself and think it's your idea that you get saved. Not a one. Don't even think about it. It's not an option. He purposed in himself to do this work in us. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. So he's saying that everything he's put together in the hands of Jesus Christ. You know? And Jesus always said, you know, I only do what the Father tells me to do. So everything was put under the feet of Christ. He became the head of everything. And therefore, um, he is the one that we have to see our salvation in, in Christ. Verse 11, in him, in Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will. So he works all things to the counsel of the will of the Father. All things are worked in that. And therefore we, uh, we gain this inheritance because God predestined it. And so this is, this is amazing, this is an amazing f understanding that we are really, really solidly protected and loved by God. And when we come to God through Christ, we know. We have the affirmation of the Holy Spirit in us and we just know that we know that we know that we are God's, that we have become God's children, that we really are followers of God. And this should change our lives completely because our hearts get changed and we just want to follow God and be obedient to God and love God. And this is how we know we're really in Christ. Verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ 
should be to the praise of his glory. We who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. So this is, this is important, that Christ loves us, that Christ has us in his hands, that the Father placed us in the hands of Christ so that we would be protected and loved and brought under his authority and he becomes our advocate in heaven. It says in verse 18, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now this is where sometimes people get it wrong. And I know for a, far, for a fact that, that um, you know, David Pawson, for one, suggests that we can lose our salvation. I do not believe that for one moment. And why? Because this is the scriptures that explain it. I am predestined to something. God doesn't make mistakes. Hello? God doesn't make mistakes. Amen? He doesn't make mistakes. And so if he's predestined you to be part of the, the family of God, and this is where some people in the past were called sealers, because they believe this firmly, and I believe I'm a sealer, in the sense that we believe that once you're saved, if you're truly saved, once you're saved, then you are sealed forever by the power of the Holy Spirit and his promise. And nothing's going to change that, and it means that I can, whatever I do, doesn't make me loved more by God. Whatever I do good, God doesn't love me any more for it. And whatever I do bad, God doesn't hate me any more for it. Because I'm under a covenant of grace. Now, you say, well, that gives you free license to do what you want. No, it doesn't. It definitely doesn't. Because my heart is changed. And my heart is telling me that I need to follow God. And when I get things wrong, I have the Holy Spirit in me that convicts me and tells me I'm wrong. And so therefore, it's not a case of just, you know, um, coming into a place and saying, yes, well, God loves me, he's given me the Holy Spirit, I'm sealed, that's it, it's all done and dusted, I can just do what I want now, and, you know, it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. But if someone is continually sinning, if someone is going away from God, then it's pretty obvious that they weren't saved in the first place. Now this is where it, it really is quite important that we make our calling and election sure. This is where it's so important that we really find out if we are saved. You know, by their fruit they shall be known. Is there fruit in your life that is honouring to God? It, are you doing things that actually show you're a Christian? Not doing things outwardly to actually show that you seem to be a Christian, but in your heart when nobody's watching, you know, do you dance before the Lord as if no one's watching? Do you actually care about what other people think of you because you're a Christian or do you just follow God? What's in your heart? Do you want to do good to people or bad? You know, what's going on? Do you want to honour God? Do you want to follow God's standards? If God puts a plumb line in front of you, how do you measure up? If you can do that and realise that, yes, I still struggle, but my heart is to follow God. My heart is to serve God and to be obedient to God. And sometimes I get it wrong, but I'm not comfortable when that happens. I'm not happy with that. And so therefore, I'm always trying to get right with God and please God. It's not a struggle because I know God loves me. And it's not a struggle to be obedient because I have a heart that's changed and wants to be a follower of God. I want to be a disciple of Christ, so it's changed. My whole life is changed, and so therefore I want to do that. When I find that I'm actually falling into sin, then I need to make sure that I don't. I need to make sure that I get right with God. And therefore I know when I'm in that place, and I know that I have reconciliation with God, and I feel comfortable in God's presence, and I just know that the Holy Spirit has given me that affirmation and I know that I'm sealed. You know, when you've had a few battles in your mind about whether you're saved or not, then eventually you settle it in your mind and you settle it in your spirit and you settle it in your soul to know that you really are God's and you know that the Holy Spirit is with you so that there doesn't need to be this continual argument or continual wondering, am I saved? Am I not saved? Am I saved? Am I not saved? No, we don't need to do that. There comes a point, you know, we have to weigh up the cost of commitment before we really come to God and say, 
please save me. You know, what am I being saved from? Well, I'm being saved from myself, from my sinful behaviour. That's what I'm being saved for. I'm being saved because I'm on a road to destruction. I'm being saved from myself. And so this is when we know, when we really have settled that and know, I don't need to keep asking God to save me. I know he saved me. I know I'm safe. I know I'm not perfect, but I know I'm safe, and I know my heart's right before God, then I know that I don't have to keep beating myself up, and I just need to bask in the love of God and continue to follow, to continue to do the do's, and let the don'ts take care of themselves, because they will. If my heart is right, I won't want to do wrong. And that's the whole point of this. And that's when I know that I'm sealed. I know that I really am part of his kingdom. Amen? Okay, let's just go to the Gospel finally, very quickly, Mark chapter 6. Just a few words on Mark's Gospel here. And it's all about Herod and John the Baptist. What do we, what do we gain from this particular passage? What do we notice in this passage? Chapter 6, verses 14 onwards. First of all, it does say one thing about the fact that when you are a minister of God that you have a responsibility to speak the truth. You have a responsibility to tell people um, when they ask you or when they're doing something wrong in front of you to actually be prepared to say, I don't believe that's honouring to God. You know, And that's exactly what John the Baptist did. Well, he was a little bit more forthright than that. You know, he called people a brood of vipers and you know, he said, you know, you need to turn before you burn, that kind of thing. He was a fiery preacher and he gave the people what for and he told them that you know this is this the way you're living is wrong you need to change and you need to start following God and so he was baptizing people in a baptism of repentance under the law that was it he was an under the law preacher Christ came and brought a new covenant but John the Baptist was basically towards the end of the dispensation of the law and so he was preaching to people about the law and telling them under the law they had been falling short by a long way and they needed to be baptized and cleansed to be following God and going back to God to repent. It was a baptism of repentance that he came with and that's why he said this person that's coming my, I'm not worthy to untie his bootstraps because this is, he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. I'm only going to baptize you in water for repentance but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so John the Baptist knew who he was. He knew that he was just a prophet. He knew that he wasn't the one who was coming. He knew, knew that he wasn't the son of God. He knew that he was a, a prophet as a forerunner. And he was the one who made the way for, for Jesus coming through. And of course Herod, at that time, a corrupt king, a puppet king to the Romans, he was you know, quite a selfish, um, typical person in, in authority who is corrupt in being very selfish and wanting everything for himself and didn't want to be told and so he kept John under lock and key because he didn't like what he was saying um, and so he tried to stifle him um, but at the same time he was frightened of him because you know prophets were people to be frightened of because they would bring the judgment of God on you so therefore it wasn't good you know to, to upset him too much outwardly um, and so it was good for him to bring him into the prison and quiet him down in the prison where nobody could hear him really and so he was able to then um, close him down to a certain degree and uh, at the same time his wife because he'd married his brother's wife Herodias she hated John the Baptist because of what he was saying because he was basically calling her an adulteress and therefore she hated him people don't like to be told when they're doing things wrong. Who likes to be told when they're doing things wrong? There's not many people who like to be told they're doing things wrong. And so Herodias was no different, and she hated him with a vengeance, so much so that she wanted him dead. And the opportunity came. Her daughter danced before Herod in front of all the officials on his birthday, and he said a stupid thing beforehand, saying that because she danced so well, um, that he would give her up to half of his kingdom and she could have whatever she asked for. Well, there you go. That was a recipe for disaster straight away. What happens when men like women? Quite often they open the wallet and they often give uh, opportunity for a woman to just 
take them for everything they have. And, and that's not a good thing. And something that is so uh, important on the spiritual side, this wasn't a good thing for him to do. But he was bragging to a certain degree to his officials and all the leaders there. And he was given opportunity for this young dancer to get almost anything because of the pleasure that he was getting in watching her dance. And they're, they're obviously his, his wife, her mother, took full advantage of this. And so therefore we have to be very careful that, you know, sometimes the flesh is, is there and we are, we are taken with attraction and we, everything that, that glitters isn't gold, you know. And so sometimes we have to be careful what we're seeing, what we're looking at, um, what's going on. Because, you know, for men quite often it can make you absolutely stupid. Um, you know, we, we can just lose complete understanding when we start to see something we want and that can be anything from a car to a house to a woman to anything and so this is something important and it goes the same way the other way too that we shouldn't be desperate in our interest in relationships and wanting people uh, to be with you know the important thing is to trust God that God's going to bring the right person along for you and that God is going to give you um, all good things if you if you wait on God but Herod certainly wasn't following God. He was going the other way. And at the same time, you know, he also um, understood that this was a man of God and he didn't want to kill him because he didn't want anything to come on himself. He didn't want the blood of John on himself. And so this is something that you know, is very important to understand that even unbelievers sometimes recognize the power of God and they recognize that God um, has the power to do all manner of things and to hold them accountable. So even though they say they don't feel they're accountable, they are understanding that they can be accountable to God.